Hello, this is Mark uh, from Microphone Boutique, and I'm here to talk about Lomo microphones. I'm going to give you a little history of Lomo microphones. Uh, this is going to be a collection of things that I've read, I've been told, I found out for myself. I, I did leave it, live in Russia for a while. I do know a lot about Russian microphones. I don't know everything about this, but uh, this will be fun. I'm just going to run through a little timeline of, of uh, Lomo microphones and talk about uh, various periods of their um, existence. Let's go. They started uh, in St. Petersburg, Leningrad. That's the L. Um, so uh, they are, uh, so Lomo's an anagram. Um, they uh, made uh, film equipment, equipment for making, you know, uh, films and microphones were needed. And if you, uh, uh, the early Lomo's are known as Kinap. So Kin, Kino, Apparatura. Uh, so the uh, film equipment. Um, so Kinop uh, made uh, the first um, Lomo microphones, or some of them are branded Kinop and some of them aren't. I guess that's a better way to, to say it. So I actually had a Kinop uh, 1989, uh, an early one, and they're identical. I think branded Kinop or Lomo, it, it doesn't matter. It's the same company. So, but they went to calling everything Lomo eventually, and you have uh, the most famous uh, Lomo um came around the 1989 that's the one to um and it has a peculiar shape uh it's a capsule and a little you know uh um, triangular kind of base and uh it's very compact for a, tu a tube microphone keep in mind other the german made tube microphones are like neumann microphone the big bottle microphones these are made for use in film so they want them to be used uh, on booms they want them to be out of the way not very visible and uh, that was kind of a, a big part of the design. In order to do this, the transformer was put in the power supply. That helped keep them very compact. So they made several microphones like this, including the 19A13. You know, the earliest Lomo microphones used this design of, uh, of um, using very particular tubes. Uh, you know, a, a, a capsule that was was. Um, very unique to the Lomo, and that's why these microphones are so legendary, because they have a sound of their own, for real. Um, the next big stop on the Lomo train would be the 19A9. This is the second most legendary, or could be the most legendary microphone. It looks kind of like a handheld microphone. Um, so it's about the size of a Shure SM58. Um, it has a capsule, um, uh, uh, you'd call it front address, I suppose, yep. And um, by then, Lomo designs tended to take a little bit from um, AKG, a little more than, from AKG than any other um, of the Eastern European companies. So uh, Lomo made everything from the top down, including uh, the connector on this microphone is, uh, is one of their own creation. And they had to be reproduced on a turning machine often they, they just there's no other connector like this they made the entire microphone and everything in it um, and designed it so what's unique about the 19A19 you have a capsule that's kinda like a um, an early AKG capsule um, that is um, um, ha has that uh, um, well, it kind of looks like a C12, an early C12 capsule. Uh, you also have it in a, in a very compact microphone body, except they did put the transformer in the body this time. Uh, the very large head basket has as much space behind the head basket as in front of it. And we know by regulating the head basket space in the rear, or we hope you know, uh, that kind of makes your, your, your microphone more or less omni. And so a wide open back head basket it makes your microphone as omni as possible and that's why they did that so uh there's a bunch of um, other microphones so this is i'd say like second generation of the lomo tube microphone let's go to the um third generation we're talking about the mid 1970s and the advent of the 8a series and these are solid state microphones now, these microphones were um the um most noticeable was the 8a5 head that went on to the, the the UM51 body. They have made interchangeable heads with different bodies, but the AA5 head is a medium diaphragm, also like an AKG uh, capsule, um, just a little smaller than the original um, 1989. It's a good substitute for a 1989 in a pinch, and as I'm making this video, they're still kind of affordable, considering a 1989 can cost $3,000. A um, 
885 is a fine microphone. It's a nice solid state preamp that's in there. And there's tube conversions for this as well. And um, AEG made a tube conversion. And they, uh, it's, a, it's a great capsule. And they still can be gotten a little cheaply for now. So you have your um, your AA series of heads, your UM5153 microphones, and this brings us up into the 80s. Now, Lomo actually made some dynamic microphones as well, but remember what they were doing was to be used in filmmaking, so not, not close address microphones necessarily. Um, they did make some dynamic microphones, most notably the um, 82A5, I think. That's that beautiful looking... Uh, small snub nose kind of uh, microphone, um, and they also made electrolytic condenser microphones. Electric condenser microphones um, were um, in the U.S. They're kind of poo pooed on a little bit um, because for us the technology came around the 70s when when cheap microphones began being made in Japan, and to us they're kind of uh, you know to our mind and even in also in uh, Western Europe as well. They're not as regarded as a, as a uh, technology. In order to put the permanent charge on the capsule, rather than having a, a you know a uh, polarization voltage put to it, um, these uh, the, the 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 diaphragms are, are are quite thick. You go from like a three to five mil diagram diaphragm uh, mylar uh, to about uh, a ten mil or something like that. Anyways, so we in the West kind of have this kind of like, ah, oh, no, no, those aren't real um, condenser mics. However, Lomo really perfected this um, this technology pretty well, and their um, and the, these Lomos, which might include the eighty-three, um, the one that's uh, that looks like a uh, the Octava O uh, twelve, uh, slipping my mind. Ooh, keep going. Um, uh, what you gotta know is these are really well designed, very good microphones, can also be gotten cheaply. This brings us up into the 80s, uh, when Lomo was petering out of, uh, out of existence a little bit. Uh, although Lomo was a very powerful company, uh, they owned a huge factory in the center of St. Peter's, but well, not quite the center, but like in the great real estate. And they had a lot of assets, they had, you know, a lot of uh, accomplishments. And they provided the Soviet film industry with, in, in a lot of uh, Eastern Europe with equipment. So, let's go to the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of Lomo. Uh, Lomo was uh, kind of involved in a bit of a money... How to say this? Okay, so Lomo was a valuable company that had assets. So it was privatized. And they did this thing that was very common in the 90s where they want to steal the assets out of a valuable company, make them their own, and then kind of sell off the shell. Kind of like a corporate raider kind of thing, except completely legal. So they made a Lomo Bank, and they took all the assets of Lomo and transferred it to Lomo Bank, and then they spun Lomo Bank out of Lomo. Um, I remember seeing some kind of advertisement for Lomo Bank, actually, going like, huh, does that have something to do with a microphone? And this is, you know, just kind of... Um, so it's true. Um... As far as I know, uh, Lomo was bankrupted uh, pretty much and kind of broken apart. So, uh, what happened after that is a little fuzzier. Maybe there should be a part two for this, but no, I'm just going to keep pushing. Um, Lomo microphones began to become popular in the West, and they began to fetch decent money. And in the Soviet Union, where people made two or three hundred dollars a month, a microphone could be sold for the a month's salary essentially in 1990. 394 and so these mics uh, you know people became Lomo hunters and to find these mics and uh, a lot of them would be in disrepair because they were all just kind of disregarded Soviet junk in there we're getting rid of this we're buying shore microphones and and um, so a lot of them were thrown out they've become quite rare and quite sought after uh, because of this there was this guy this former um, Lomo engineer whose uh, website his name is Sasha and his website is Adida, 
or was, is or was, and he made Lomo, uh, he bought a bunch of, or had made a bunch of bodies, and he made what he called the Lomo second edition, or, you know, something like that. There's a bunch of Lomo 1989 microphones out there that all have the cero, same serial number on them, and they're all made out of spare Lomo parts, including a new Vista tube instead of the um, 6 uh, S31 tube that is uh, ordinarily in that microphone. <coughs> um, very different sound and very different build quality. Um, I've run across some, I bought one of his microphones once. Uh, the power supply looked like a homemade explosive. Uh, just, you know, just things, you know, silicon goop, keeping, holding things in place and point to point, but not in a good way. So, those exist. And, um, uh, and there's also Neva Tone, in the Neva River in, in St. Petersburg. These were also some ex Lomo engineers who would um, go on to make microphones separately of Lomo, but try to keep that uh, heritage in there. So, we're going to bring this to a wrap up. Thanks for watching. I hope that was informative. I hope you learned a little bit. And I'll try to put more informational videos here too when I can. And thanks for watching.